someone accused you, which was a frenzy stunt by a bunch of teenage girls, if someone accused you, the first thing they'd do is put you to the test to see if you really were a witch, like hold you underwater. If you survive that, then you're a witch, then they'd hang you. No way out situation. We've just taken a right onto Beacon Hill, and this is the first planned neighborhood in the city of Austin. And this, my friends, was pasture land. Up until 1800, when developers bought this property and started to build these beautiful homes. Look at the detail in the construction. You just don't see this anymore. The iron work, the stone work. Um, behind the flags is the American Meteorological Society. Now, this granite building was once the home of John Singleton Copley, uh, the man who they named Copley Square after. Uh, later on, the Somerset Club, a private men's club, bought it from him, and now that's their headquarters. On the right is the frog pond. No frogs. Um, that's used by the little kids in the summertime. They hose it out, and it's nice and clean, and they wade in it. In the wintertime, it freezes over, and they ice skate on it. Snoop Dogg! What? <laughs> My favorite site that was on the left-hand side, Massachusetts State House. The oldest state house in the nation, and yes, that dome is real gold. That is 13 pounds of 23 karat gold leaf. That dome was first made out of wood, and it leaked like a sieve. Paul Revere came up and covered it in copper, and finally they gilded it in gold. Paul Revere was quite the guy, you know. Two wives, 16 children. The ultimate minute man. Thank you, thank you. On my left, that lady seated, Mary Dyer, a Quaker. Not a good thing to be in Puritan Boston. They banned her from the colony. She kept returning. On the third time she returned, they hanged her on Boston Common. Puritans came here for religious freedom. Didn't want to give it to anyone else. Do I have any attorneys on board? That's the oldest power association in America, founded by John Adams himself. Anybody remember the TV show, Allie McBeal? 14 Beacon. I'll do it for you. Oh! <laughs> then we have the Athenaeum on the right-hand side. A private library built up here on Beacon Hill in 1800. Many of George Washington's books are in there. The next time I say Snoop Dogg, we go quack, quack, Jack. How you doing, my friend? Where's the hat? Too windy, you're going to lose it? Snoop Dogg! Quack, quack, Jack! They're getting better, my friend. They are getting better. district that we're in. Not a lot happening in finances, so we'll just buzz right through. All right, let me start from the left. The building with the big brown columns is the King's Chapel. It's the oldest Anglican church in the city. Did I hear someone say they were from Great Britain on board? Oh, okay. The oldest, do you feel at home now? <laughs> Very much. Um, the street that we're about to turn on to is School Street. There isn't a school on School Street. There isn't water on Water Street or court on Court Street. Times is changing. But at one time, this was the site of the first public school in America. That school has evolved into Boston Latin this year, celebrating 376 years. On my right, the Parker House Hotel. This is the oldest continually operated hotel in the nation. John Wilkes Booth stayed there eight days before he assassinated President Abraham Lincoln. I make a lot of noise out front. Watch the eyes on this guy. Snoop Dogg! Quack, quack. The doors of this hotel have not closed since 1855. Go and check it out. It's a really cool spot. On my left is our original city hall. Um, out in front is a statue of Ben Franklin. He was a wise old man. He said, you went to marriage with your eyes wide open. After you married, keep your mouth shut. Everybody look to the left and go, cheese. You ready? Go ahead. Take our photograph. Cheese. <laughs> That public school was where that um, city hall sits. By the way, they put a Ruth Chris Steakhouse in there, and the atmosphere and the food are actually are, are absolutely perfect. So, um, do I have anybody with a little bit of Irish blood in their body? There's a memorial to the potato famine on my right-hand side. 
that brought a lot of those poor starving Irish people to Boston and they helped build this city. But if you look ahead to the right, you see the brick building, that's the old salt meeting house, that's where the Sons of Liberty planned such retaliatory measures against the British as the Boston Tea Party. I'm going to tell you a story. This is called the Boston Massacre. And it happened out in front of our original state house. I'll show you that in a minute. That was built in 1713. One night in March of 1770, out in front of that state house, one lonely sentry was guarding the building. A group of young locals came by. They started harassing him, calling him names, throwing snowballs at him. And he feared for his life. So he called for some reinforcements. Five or six came to his aid. The crowd got a little larger, a little angrier. Then the church bells in the neighborhood started to ring. That's a sign that there's a fire. Someone yelled fire, and they fired into the crowd. Shortly thereafter, five young locals were dead. That uh, inflamed the passion for freedom. On my left-hand side, that's our state house. It's almost 300 years old, 1713. See the lion and the unicorn on the rooftop? Those are symbols of the British crown. And there's a balcony out in front. From that balcony, the Declaration of Independence was first read here in Boston on July 18, 1776. You know what's in the basement of that building? A tea station, rapid transit. The train comes rumbling through about every five minutes. I'm surprised it hasn't fallen down yet. But it's in good shape. <laughs> Under the Gold Dome on the right-hand side is Faneuil Hall, a gift to the city of Boston by Peter Faneuil. And that, my friends, has been nicknamed the Cradle of Liberty because of all the discussions held there on the Revolution. Look way up to the very, 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 very top. What do you see? Grasshopper, cricket, okay, yeah. I had a kids group on last week, someone yelled out a cockroach. That's a time capsule and a weather van, and that grasshopper is said to have been eyewitness to both the Boston Massacre and the Boston Tea Party. And if you're in town during the revolution, someone might ask you, which way did the bug fly? And if you didn't know, they'd know that you're a stranger in town, and you might be a spy for the British. They always had their ways. Oh. On the right-hand side, there's a statue of a man standing. I'll tell you a story about him out on the water. The oldest restaurant in America is coming up in a moment, the Union Oyster House. 1826, they opened their doors. Great place to come and try, the chowder. Can we all yell chowder? Chowder. chowder. These six glass towers are the New England Holocaust Memorial. Each of those towers represent a death camp in Nazi Europe. Inscribed into every one of those towers are a million random numbers. Each number represents a Jew murdered during the Holocaust by the Nazis. Very moving memorial. You might want to take a closer look. It's about a minute's walk from Quincy Market. Wait till you see the view I'm going to give you down the whole length of it. You'll see the steam coming up. And that steam represents the gas in those ovens. Kind of eerie looking, isn't it? Then we have the oldest tavern in America, ahead of me to the right, Bell in Hand, 1795. It's 5 o'clock somewhere. You guys want to stop in for a quick one? Hell yeah. <laughs> How do you really feel? <coughs> Look way over to the left. That's the Leonard P. Zakin Bunker Hill Bridge. It's the widest cable uh, state bridge in the world. As the land is coming towards you, you see it's turning green, and it's green throughout the entire city to the right-hand side. This is the Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy Greenway. Underneath this uh, is the traffic that gets funneled through Boston in the tunnels, um, also known as the Big Dig, the largest public works project in America. Let me tell you about that. In 1950, that was a rickety old bridge that went across Boston Harbor, that Zakin Bridge. And where it hit ground, they built a 50-foot high, six-lane wide highway that went right through the middle of Boston. It was designed for 70,000 automobiles a day. Very adequate for its time. Many households didn't even have an automobile. But fast forward 50 years, the roadway designed for 70 is now carrying 220,000. And it was gridlock for a good portion of the time. But we had Tip O'Neill and Ted Kennedy, two very important politicians, were able to get the funding for the Big Dig project. 
which, by the way, was supposed to take four years and cost $1.5 billion. Uh, wrong answer. What did happen, though, is it took 10 years and 14.8 slash 22 billion with all the interest taken into consideration. And that was a federally funded project, so we here in Massachusetts. Thank you all very much. Uh, on my right, everybody, is the North End. Has anybody been to the North End so far? It's a really cool spot. It's our little Italy. There are over a hundred great Italian restaurants in the North End. A lot of cafes where after a hot day of sightseeing, you can stop in and have a nice fresh cannoli, wash it down with a cappuccino, frappuccino, maybe even an Al Pacino. There's a pizza place in the North End, Regina Pizza. We've been making pizza in the same location with the same oven for 85 years. If you get a chance, check it out. It's right down this Thatcher Street on the right-hand side. It's usually a line out in front. Yep, yep, yep. yep. It's always a good way to tell if something's good. Uh, I can see the Bunker Hill Monument right through my windshield. The Battle of Bunker Hill happened on June 17. 1775, but on the 16th, spies for the Patriots found out about the British plan to come and occupy the high ground in Charleston. Now the British Army, they were already the most powerful army in the world, the Patriots, a bunch of farmers and tradesmen who don't even have enough ammunition for the revolution. As soon as we found out about their plan, we marched up Bunker Hill, fortified it with bunkers and bunkers, and waited for the British to come. And they came the next day, 2100, rode across Boston Harbor, right in this area. They got to the base of Bunker Hill, and were already up on the hill with strict orders not to fire until we saw the whites of their eyes, because we didn't have enough ammunition. We wanted to make sure for each shot there wasn't kill. Well, they made their first attempt, and we waited patiently. We saw the whites of their eyes fired and killed many of them. It was a very bloody scene. On the second assault, we waited again, fired and killed many more. The blood was flowing. On the third assault, however, we waited, fired, killed many more, and then we ran out of ammunition. We didn't retreat until we fought them with rocks and sticks and rifle butts. We couldn't hold the hill any longer. That's when we retreated. So yes, we did lose that battle, but it was a huge moral victory. We had just taken on the most powerful army in the world and beat them back, not once but twice, and proved that maybe we could win the revolution. So we're in Charlestown, Massachusetts. I'm going to bring you over to see the over to the Charlestown Navy Yard, and while we are here, here, we're going to stop open and see the USS Constitution, which is the oldest commission warship afloat in the world. Here's the Buckhill Monument. It's 294 steps to the top. You can climb it if you're feeling spocky today. Okay, this is the Charlestown Navy Yard. You can come back here for a free tour if you so desire, which is a, it is a good tour. On my left is the USS Constitution. It's the oldest commissioned warship afloat in the world. And here's a side view of it. It's low tide, so some of it's missing. But um, that's a free tour also. The oldest commissioned warship afloat in the world. Sorry to say, my friend from Great Britain. Because you do have a ship that's older than ours. I don't know if you know your history. It's uh, the HMS Victory, but it is in dry dock. This one, they'll take it out for sale on the 4th of July, which is pretty cool. They'll have the fire uh, boats uh, leading it with the, the waters shooting up in the air, and they'll fire the cannons off. It's really cool to see. Now, when she sailed, she had a crew of 450 men and boys. Just take a wild guess. How old you had to be to join the Navy back then? Twelve. Twelve. Good guess. Uh, anybody else? Fifteen? Uh, wrong way. Ten. Uh, eight years old. Isn't that something? It's the truth, too. They called them powder monkeys. Their job was to go below decks and bring powder up to the cannons during times of battle. 
which is a very dangerous job because often there were snipers in the mass of the opposing ships trying to pick them off as they scurried across the deck with the powder for the cannons. I know it sounds cruel and unusual, but think of it. Life expectancy back then was about 35 years of age. A lot of those kids were orphaned, abandoned. Navy took them in, fed them, clothed them, gave them an education, taught them a trade, even paid them $8 a month. They were better off than a lot of eight-year-olds of their day. So, well, let me talk about the monument for a minute. I was born right here in Charlestown, Massachusetts. I haven't strayed very far. When I was a kid, I didn't have a laptop or an iPod, but I did have the Buckingham Monument. I could go to the top of that any time of the day and night. There was never a locked gate or a guard to turn us away. I would bring a bag of those balls with airplanes and throw them out from the top. Can you imagine how far they'd fly? But like anything, you do it enough, it started to get boring, so we decided to step it up a notch. We started soaking them in lighter fluid, lighting them on fire and throwing them out. I kept us busy for a while on that. But always get caught and catch a beat, but we'll be right back there the next day. Paul Revere started his midnight ride right from the location on my right, because if you look to the left, you can see the steeple of the old knot church. Oh, I'll do it for you. I'll give you another view of it in a minute. I'm hanging out in the middle of the road here. I wanted Paul Revere yell as he rode through the countryside, Snoop Dogg! Ah! Well, he didn't yell that. But he did, didn't yell the British were coming. He yelled the regulars were coming, meaning the regular British army. So we think of it, had he yelled the British were coming? wouldn't know what he was talking about because everybody here was British. They might have hit him with the shoe and told him to go sleep it off. Yeah, we know, Paul. You're already here, buddy. Get the sauce again, huh? Yeah, Henry Lord Good Longfellow put that in his poem, The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. Kids have been taught that ever since. He never mentioned the man William Dawes, the man who finished the ride, but nothing rhymes with Dawes except maybe Draws, and how are you going to finish that? Put that in the hole. Here's a nice view of part of Boston Harbor on the left-hand side. You can see the control tower at the airport. That's East Boston across the bay. That's connected uh, by a bridge and three tunnels, in case you live over in uh, East Boston. That was once three islands. That's all been filled in. There were a busy bunch of people in the 1800s. in the 70s, they wrote a top 10 hit about it, called Up That Dirty Water. They play it at Fenway Park, whatever the Red Sox. And my friends, it wasn't always included for thousands of years. The Indians lived along its banks. They hunted, they swam, they fished, they even drank its water, and it suited them just fine. But then, in 1630, the Puritans landed, and it didn't take long. Fifty years later, they wrote a proclamation stating that it was legal to throw garbage and carcasses into the river. Nice word, that word carcass, isn't it? We used to have a governor, Duke Carcass, remember him? Anyway, they didn't learn that behavior here. They learned it in the countries they came from, England, Germany, China, France, probably doing it in those countries for thousands of years before they got here. And many rivers in the United States became polluted. The Hudson, the Mississippi, the Potomac, just to name a few. There are two rivers that I mention on every tour. One is in Ohio, and it was the inspiration for the Clean Water Act. The Cuyahoga River was so polluted with oil in the 70s 
that it caught on fire three times. Then there's the Chicago River. Anybody from Chicago? Well, behind the stockyards and slaughterhouses that were used to feed the nation would be for about a hundred years. Billions of heads of that butchered slaughtered cattle were thrown right into the Chicago River and then flowed behind those stockyards. Um, those rivers have been cleaned up from what I understand. But the Charles River had its own issues. It was polluted. So polluted, the last mile was called the lost mile. All of the fish had died. And when there aren't any fish, there certainly isn't a reason for the birds to hang out. There were areas that were pink, areas that were orange, and if you fell into it, they suggested that you get a tetanus shot. It was, it was awful. Well, things went on status quo until around 1990. The federal judge, oh, the federal judge ordered to clean up of Boston Harbor and surrounding waterways. It was one of the dirties to the nation. Um, I think it was a, like $11 billion project. The first thing they did was build a water treatment plant out in Boston Harbor. They investigated any and all sources of pollution. Charles River would have been one of those sources of pollution. They passed legislation. They cleaned up the Charles River. They did whatever they had to do, and it was all a success. Because from one of the ten dirtiest rivers in the country, the Charles River is now one of the ten cleanest rivers in the country. As a B-plus rating, safe to swim at 97% of the time. Snoop Dogg! Wow. And every time I say that, I think it deserves a hand because we're cleaning up the old messes for the young generation. We had nothing to do with making them dirty. I'm going to show you the original Mother Goose. A real Mother Goose. She's a mother and she's a goose. Look at the whiskey bow. Now, I believe that I have shown you one jail with a water view. I'm going to show you two more just to let you know how well we treat our prisoners here in Massachusetts. Look over to the right-hand side. See the building with the red band around it? From the red band up, Cambridge Jail. From the red band down, Cambridge Court. Then the third jail I'm going to show you is the second oldest in the country. The oldest is in Salem, Massachusetts, where they hang the witches. Oh, that right there, that's the second, then the third one will be in a minute. Then the third one, uh, like I said, the second oldest in the country. But by the time I finish my story, you might want to throw a brick throw a window and take a six month vacation here. We went by the Union Oyster House a little while ago. We all yelled chowder, right? Kind of synonymous with Boston. What other kind of seafood? They quack, think quack. Boston. <laughs> Lobster. I'd swear that you were a native, my friend, the way you said it. Lobster. Years ago, lobster was considered trash food because they're bottom feeders. Some cultures still don't eat them today for that reason. They were so abundant and considered trash food that we used to feed them to the prisoners. So often, in fact, that eventually they filed a bill stating that we could only feed the lobster twice a week. So you know they were getting so much more than that. Imagine the conversation in the dining hall. Bill, no. lobster kid tonight, I'm ready to kill someone. Oh, I did kill someone. Never mind, pass the lobster. I'll always get myself in trouble. <laughs> okay, you're probably all wondering, what's this weird guy doing now? Anybody want to come up and drive my duck? Bring your camera. Hi, lady. Careful of this. Don't bang your head, okay? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I forgot about that. Let me just adjust it. There we go. So, from Utah, and what's your name? Morgan. Cool. And uh, you're just doing a little visiting and sightseeing. Okay, Morgan, we're going to head for that opening. See underneath the four towers? Right in the middle. See the four towers on the bridge? Okay, we're gonna head right through that opening, okay? The Puritans settled in Cambridge in 1630. They wanted to start a new town. They weren't too creative in naming their new town, so what do you suppose they called their new town? I just gave you three hints. New town. And after a while, they wanted to have a school so their sons could be educated like they were in England, so they started the college of New Town. But then there was a man from Charlestown who had a lot of money and a lot of books, Morgan. 
he died. He left half his money and all of his books to the College of Newtown. What was that man's name? <laughs> Anybody know? You all know it. You've all heard the name? Harvard, correct. John Harvard, beginning at Harvard University. And according to the figures, the figures that I read in 2008 before the economy hit the fan, Harvard University was worth, any wild guesses? 37.5 billion, that's with a B, dollars. The largest endowment of a university in the world, second only to the Vatican. That's obscene, actually, isn't it? I think they should open their doors for 10 years, don't you? Free Harvard education for everyone? I went to Harvard. What a week that was. My mother wanted me to be a doctor, but if you say doctor fast enough, it's on you. Morgan, you're doing an excellent job. With your left hand, with your left hand, would you turn and give me a salute? No, not a wave. Good job, good job. Don't hit the bridge. If you missed the dome of the State House, look to the left, there is a beautiful view. Up on top of Beacon Hill, that gold dome. Isn't that pretty? <laughs> All right, you were doing going so smooth there for a while. You were going so smooth for a while. You haven't been drinking today, have you, Morgan? Okay. But you got the knack of it already. I saw you. You're not oversteering. This is the Longfellow Bridge that we're about to go under. It's 103 years old, named after the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. It looks 100. Excuse me, 104. It looks 104, doesn't it? last major work was done in 1950. Things go well by the year 2000. Well, actually, it's, it started already, the work. They're ready to spend $280 million to fix and redo this bridge. I don't get it. The Zaykum Bridge only cost 107 to build. You know what I think? I think you need the hat. Look at me. Give us a little one more time. <laughs> All right, let's go this way. This is what I call the million dollar view of Austin. It's not to bring it back already. It's not bringing it back. Trust me on that. Yeah. It towards the Sitco side. See it very way up river? Fedway Park is right to the left of that. And in fact, see the night lights? Look to the building with the little flag on top to the left. Then see what looks like little radiators? To the left of that. Oh, it's got little fins and stuff. You can see. Anyway, the nightlights are over. Um, <laughs> if you look up the banks of the Charles River to the right hand side, you'll see a building that appears to have a golf ball on its roof. That's part of the campus for MIT. That campus extends for about a mile along the banks of the Charles River. Look very intense at what you're doing. Good, don't wreck it. 350,000. See the bird? Oh, there he goes. That's a cormorant. They're like a duck, but they don't have any oil in their feathers, and they can dive between 70 and 130 feet. Eat fish. It's a good sign when you see them in a river like this. It means the river's alive and doing well. There we go. I want to take a slow swing and we'll do a circle. Okay, I mentioned MIT. I want you to look to the building that looks like a apartment building in front of the golf ball building. Then see the dome that's appearing to the left of that? That's the main building for MIT. We all agree some bright minds go to MIT. Each year around graduation time, it becomes the obsession of the graduating class to perform a little mayhem on the administrators of the school. A number of years ago, the administrators woke up to find on the roof of that building a fully functioning police cruiser. The lights were flashing, the siren was blaring, there was a dummy on the inside with a full police uniform on it when they found it. It had a hot cup of coffee in the cup holder and a bag of donuts on the front seat. How's that for stereotyping, huh? Okay, I'm gonna straighten it out a little bit. Okay there, Morgan? Ah, oh, he'll get out of the way. <laughs> if he knows what's good for him. I'm gonna go up back underneath that opening. If you have a wish list of something that you might like to do before you get too old to do it, put down, come to Boston by the 4th of July. Trust me, I don't use this word unless I'm describing the 4th of July. Awesome. Picture this, 450 boats anchored in this bay. Um, everybody comes from Maine to Cape Cod. Uh, they want to 
see it from the, the vessels. Half a million people lying on the banks of the Childs River. Look over your right hand shoulder, you'll see a, a, a band shell. That's the Hatch Memorial shell. Uh, each year the Boston Pops Orchestra comes out and they play all the feel good songs for the 4th of July. America the Beautiful, Stars and Stripes Forever, Yankee Doodle Dandy. And my favorite, the 1812 Overture. You know the one I'm talking about. They fire the cannon off in the middle. In Boston, they fire four howitzer cannons off twice. You can feel the percussion, smell the gun smoke. And it's time for the fireworks. Last year, they shot 25,000 pounds of fireworks off in 21 minutes. Spectacular. Doing an excellent job. Look over to the right. See the building with all the sailboats in front of it? That's community boating. That's a project started in 1941 by a local businessman who wanted to do something for the inner city youth. That program was and still available today. If you are between the ages of 10 and 18, you can learn to sail and sell for the entire season for one dollar. Isn't that cool? Would anybody else like to come up and drive my dog? <laughs> yeah, really? You're all good? Okay. I think you should come up. Want to drive my duck? I'll take your photograph with her camera. She can get back from vacation and go, I don't know who she is, but she was driving the duck. <laughs> I owe you a jail, don't I? I? Told you three jails are the one of you. See the beige cupola, the granite building under it? That was once the Charles Street Jail, built in 1851 to house Boston's bad guys. Continuously operated as a jail till 1990 when a federal judge closed it because of the living conditions. See the red duck? Head right to the right of that. We're going to go around the bend. Okay? So don't get too close. Don't get too far out. Just keep going straight ahead. It's not... It's not used... Don't worry about it. He'll get out of the way. Um, it's not used as a jail anymore. They closed it in 1990 because of living conditions. And they turned it into a luxury hotel called the Liberty. How's that for irony to the 10th power? They call it the Liberty Hotel. Um, remember I showed you the statue of James Michael Curley? I said I'll tell you a story about him out on the water. In the early 1900s, the Irish had a solid foothold on the politics here in Boston. And he was a very charismatic politician, James Michael Curley was. He was senator, governor, and mayor five times. The man couldn't lose. Well, he took a civil service exam for one of his constituents who couldn't read or write. He got caught. They charged him with mail fraud, and they put him in that Charles Street jail. And while he was in there, he ran for alderman, and he won. Every time I have people from Louisiana and Chicago on board, they go, wow, it sounds like old. Look at you go, girl. Just what you do, huh? So what do you do out in Utah? You work in a grocery store. Cool. Nice that you're traveling. Wait, wait, wait. Let me get this guy in the background and get shot. I guess I won't be getting that one. Oh well, I can't get it to work for me anyway. It's okay. I'm going to tell you the story about the ducks. I have a lot of information on them, and they're kind of cool stories. These were uh, very important during the Second World War. This is a replica, like I said. During the Second World War, America was sending men and supplies over to Europe and the South Pacific by way of Liberty ships. And often, those ships didn't have deep water ports to sail into. In the South Pacific, they may have had to anchor a half a mile offshore to then get the men and supplies to shore somehow, or in Europe, dock 50 to 100 miles away from where they were needed, then they would have to either march or truck the men and supplies to the front lines, really time-consuming and dangerous. How desperately did they need these docks? Well, from idea to prototype, it took 38 days. From prototype to full production for six months, General Motors got the contract, and in their Pontiac, Michigan plant, they built 21,000 of them at a cost of $10,600 a piece. And because the men were off the wall, who do you think built them? The women! 
Let's hear it for the ladies. Come on, give it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 65 years old, still going strong. I'm going to take over, okay, honey? Please, she says. Good job. Let me snag my hat. I lose more hats that way. You're good? Wait, 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 wait. There we go. <laughs> In a perfect world, they could fit uh, 25 fully equipped soldiers, bring them right up onto the beach, and not even get wet because they were six-wheel drive. But a perfect world didn't happen very often during times of war. Many times they lost the men, the supplies, and the duck just to the heavy surf trying to get to shore. Our machine gun fire would be coming across the bow. Shells exploding overhead. And the top speed on these ducks in the water was just six and a quarter miles an hour. Now you know where the term sitting duck came from. Actually, I have no idea where the term sitting duck came from, but it does sound logical. Leaving the beaches was a different story. They could hold 12 stretchers with wounded or fatally wounded on board. And when they had a precious cargo like that, they'd pull right up next to a hospital ship, and that ship would lower a crane entire duck out of the water. They did what they had to do. Now these were a civilian idea. It was capitalism at its best. The men were building war machines. They were going to help the war effort probably make a bundle of money at the same time. So they were demonstrating them to the Army down in Chatham on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And the Army wasn't very impressed. It didn't look like they were going to buy them. Until a big storm blew in and it stranded the Coast Guard cutter on a sandbar offshore. And it was too dangerous to send rescue boats out to get them. But the guys were there with the ducks and they said we could do it. They performed the rescue. The Army was impressed. They made an about face on the decision. They started production shortly thereafter. There were a, a thousand of these ducks when they invaded Sicily, bringing the men and supplies to shore. And there were many more when they uh, stormed the beaches of Normandy. I'm not, I don't know how many, but it was an enormous amount. They did help shot the war. So my friends, this is the deepest part of the Charles River. It's 25 feet deep. The rest of the river is 12 to 15 feet. And if you go four miles up, it drops to six feet. So it's not a very deep river. People ask me often about this pier. This was used by the big sailing ships to tie up to when the locks were working. Um, it's not needed anymore, as you can see. There's two government agencies arguing over the ownership of it. Neither of them want to own it, so it will probably be up for another 50 years. I hope they don't tear it down. It's kind of cool to look at. little baby geese on the uh, land by the by the mothers and the fathers up there. They're cute now. Snoop Dogg! <laughs> and here's that luxury jail. <laughs> Is that luxury jail? And you know I'm only kidding when I say luxury. It's a jail. You never, ever, ever want to be in a spot like that. Looks nice on the outside. Concrete walls, concrete floors on the inside. It's a jail. However, it is a nice looking jail. And we have a sense of humor here in Boston. We've given that jail two nicknames. One is the Glamour Slammer, and the other is the Taj Majel. Okay, don't worry about the sounds. It's just me. Building over the right is the Spalding Rehabilitation Center. They are doing wonderful work in the rehabilitation business. That here on the water belongs to them. And they take patients with injuries, as severe as spinal cord injuries. They bring them out onto the water and they row those canoes and kayaks, wine style hovering your canoes. Get those patients to move in ways they never could get them to move in the therapy room.
Okay, I put it in four-wheel drive a moment ago. You're going to feel a bump. Just to sit in the ramp. And we are good to go. Hope you guys like that part of the tour. I'm going to tell you a story. And it's about this kill warrior was here. I know there's lots of folks that have seen it, even in other countries, and you probably wondered what it was all about. I have the story. James Kilroy was a rivet counter at the Fort <laughs> River Shipyard in Quincy, Massachusetts during the Second World War. His job was, at the end of every shift, to count up how many rivets a rivet had produced. He would put a chalk line at the end of their work. And then those riveters would get paid cash by how many they did on their ship. Well, the riveters figured out after a while, if they erased that chalk line, Another rivet counter might come along and they would get paid twice for the same amount of work and that would be a very good day for them. So James Kilroy started using a heavy crayon and writing his name. Kilroy was here. That made it much more difficult to erase. Now what they were working on were those Liberty ships. They were 500 feet long. You can imagine how many times the man's name was written on the inside of the ship. It was everywhere. And often they didn't have time to paint the inside because as soon as it was finished, they loaded it. long journey overseas, the men grew so used to seeing Kilroy was here, everywhere they looked, washing their face, putting their pants on, or having lunch, but when they got to their ports of call, they started writing it on walls and fences where they had landed, and that let the Allies know that we were there first. Simple signal is what it, simple signal is what it turned out to be.